Brian Schwann, council member. Troy Tabor, council member. Ben Lawrence, mayor. Clark C.R. Nelson, council member. Greg Schneider, council member. Mike Warrington, council member. Mike Keller, police chief. Donna Davis, chief financial officer. Chad Russell, fire chief. I do know my name, but before I say it, I want to make sure everyone saw the slide tonight that our live web streaming does not have audio tonight. Our Cox City 7 live streaming is working, but there's a hiss in the background. Oh, let's get out of here. <laughs> On YouTube in one to two days, this video in its entirety with audio will be available. I'm Jennifer McCausland, assistant city administrator. JT Klaus, city attorney. Les Mangus, director of public works. I have nothing to do with IT. All about you, Mr. Clerk. <laughs> Susan Renner, City Clerk. Mark Detter, City Administrator. All right, item three this evening is the invocation. I don't see Pastor Ivy this evening. Troy, would you mind uh, leading us in that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Let's start off first by saying something I read today um, that I thought was relevant. It says, always pray to have eyes that see the best in people, a heart that forgives the worst, mind that forgets the bad, and a soul that never lo loses faith in God. So with that, I'll start the prayer. Thank you for allowing us to gather today in this, uh, in this wonderful facility, in this wonderful um, city with uh, the wonderful people that, that work very hard every day to keep it that way. And I pray that as we uh, discuss different issues tonight that uh, we do it with uh, your thoughts in mind and we listen to uh, what is appropriate for our city. And this I ask in your name. Amen. Please stand with us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't think so. All right, item number five is the public forum. Is there anyone here that wishes to address the council? Seeing none, we will close the public forum and move on to item six, which is the acceptance of the agenda. Any modifications this evening, Mr. Ditter? Uh, I, don't, I don't have anything. I just, you know, we need to be mindful that our audio is not streaming out live. However, you... Uh, think of that and I'm not gonna you know do you like me to say something about that but well, I, I guess I'm I'm wondering if you view anything on the agenda any differently because someone can't watch it live well why don't you write a note post it up there yeah on screen it says audio doesn't work All right listen to YouTube uh, later okay mr. mayor uh, I would move to accept the agenda as presented second a motion by CR, second by Mike, to accept the agenda as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We will move on to item number seven. I believe we have a couple presentations this evening. We'll start off with uh, Wampo. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Scott Wadle from the City of Wichita here to present on the uh, Connecting Communities Public Transit Study that was conducted uh, by a number of different communities. All right, so we'll see if the remote works. Perfect. So uh, the agenda for the presentation is fairly simple. I uh, just wanted to brief you all on the purpose of it, uh, do an overview of that, talk about the results, and then talk a little bit about the process and then additional resources that are available if you'd like more information. So the uh, one quick note is that there's been no commitments made for implementation of this. I just want to simply uh, convey that this is a study at this point. So uh, the findings are up for discussion and, and just information only. So the purpose of the study itself was to evaluate demand um, and interest uh, for transit service in primarily four communities, Andover, Derby, Hayesville, and Mays. And the results of that study, in particular for Andover, are that uh, the analysis and community engagement, as you can see on the slide, did not indicate significant demand or interest in fixed route service within the city of Andover. 
and uh, this can be found on page 110 of the report uh, and that is given current conditions now within the report they talked about in the future uh, potential options and uh, different routes should demand grow and we'll talk a little bit about how that conclusion was arrived to or that finding but uh, the three routes there were four routes that were evaluated for potential service in the future uh, one of them uh, and three of them were found to be relatively feasible um, the first one would utilize 21st Street to connect to the Wichita Transit system uh, another one would uh, utilize, and it's tough to uh, read this one, another one would utilize Central uh, to provide that access, and then uh, the third one would utilize Kellogg. And all of them uh, have 60 minute frequency, and in the report it identifies uh, that it's better to start small and then scale up uh, as demand warrants. So the cost of providing these services, of, of providing one of these routes, uh, is approximately $340,000 a year um, and that there would also be additional costs that were not specified in the study or in the report uh, and that is in because you're required uh, by the FTA to provide complimentary ADA service uh, should uh, fixed route service be provided and that uh, ADA service is required within three quarters of a mile of any fixed route service. So the process. So how, uh, how were they conclu these conclusions and findings arrived at? Uh, first, there was a data collection phase, and this is summarized in an existing conditions report uh, that's available on the project website. Uh, they looked at uh, demographic, employment, uh, housing data, uh, also destinations where trips uh, beginning and ending. And then there was a qualitative assessment that was done uh, through a series of community uh, discussions, community meetings, and an online survey. There's a, here's a, a few slides with a little bit of information from that. So uh, they looked at employment density. Um, uh, uh, darker uh, colors indicate uh, a higher concentration. Uh, they looked at population density as well. And then they, uh, they created a, a matrix, really, that looks at a combination of population density and access to vehicles. They looked at trip information uh, coming and going from Andover to Wichita and also uh, trips that uh, originate and end in Andover itself. They looked at uh, public transit uh, existing options in uh, various communities. Here you can see pictures of uh, services offered by Butler County, Derby, and uh, Sedgwick County. And then they looked at uh, how those, current, those services are currently being utilized. So, and again, there's much greater detail in the existing uh, conditions report available online. The community survey, uh, the, so there was an online survey that was conducted. Uh, I looked into the numbers. It appears that there were about 88 uh, people who participated in the, sur in the uh, survey and indicated that they were from Andover. Uh, out of the, uh, the survey feedback, if you look in the, uh, the top left-hand corner of this slide, you'll see Andover's uh, results. And the majority of folks said, uh, no, they really weren't interested in transit service at this time, uh, or they indicated that they weren't really sure. So in summary of the community feedback, uh, the consultants developed this, uh, this slide, which uh, indicates that uh, you know, relative to other communities, the demand for fixed route transit service is, uh, is relatively low. Uh, as well as uh, the interest for it is relatively low in, in Andover currently. So in terms of uh, resources, so where can you learn uh, more and dig uh, more in depth into the details of the study? There's a project website that's up and running, uh, ConnectingCommunitiesKansas.com, uh, uh, and there you can find the existing conditions report and the uh, final report itself. Uh, as well, I also wanted to put in a plug-in for um, there is a regional transit study that is uh, being started up uh, at WAMPO, and so it'll be interesting to see what the results are of that. that will be looking at transit service as a whole uh, in our region. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. No questions? Appreciate it. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, second one up is the uh, Master Fire Plan. Chief, you have an update for us? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor and Council community, thank you very much for letting me have this opportunity. 
You'll remember in November of 17, we uh, engaged CityGate LLC to come to Andover and do a comprehensive fire service plan. That comprehensive fire service plan looked at everything your fire department does from A to Z, from bottom to top, and uh, found 33 findings in their study that was presented to you and 18 recommendations. And tonight I want to come to you to talk about those uh, 18 recommendations and give you an update of where we are. Before I do that, I would like to remind everybody that Police and Fire Festival is June 1st. It's a great opportunity to get out and meet your police officers and firefighters. We'd love to have you down at the park. So when we're talking about the recommendations, I'll go through them one by one as briefly as possible, but I want to make sure you get the information. Recommendation one and two um, both talked about performance measures and particularly performance measures around responses. So um, their recommendations were that we would establish, for instance, 90% of the time we expect to have the first due fire truck on the scene of a fire within seven minutes and 30 seconds. So that would be an example of a performance measure that they suggested that we establish. Um, we have not established those performance measures yet. However, we are watching the data. The reason we haven't established them yet is we're still working with Andover 911 and Butler County 911 to make sure that we're all measuring the same thing and doing it accurately. So we're working on, with both to get the accuracy of the data. Uh, where we need it to be. I can tell you that in 2018, your number rather than 90% was 82% for your first due apparatus. And what that really measures, what we would use that for, is distribution of fire stations. If you start falling outside that 90%, then you need to think about what's causing that. One of the common causes is travel time, which would mean you would need to build new fire stations. Um, your time rather than 7.30 was actually 9 minutes and 30 seconds in 2018. The next thing that was talked about is what recommendation 1.2 was effective response force, fire department jargon, four. We want this many trucks and this many people to show up at a first alarm residential structure fire within this much time, 90% of the time. And uh, the effective response force was 13 people with four apparatus, one ladder, three engines, and then they would need to have supervision there, so we would want two chiefs. So uh, that all needs to occur within 11 minutes and 30 seconds, 90% of the time. In 2018, you see that we were uh, not successful in accomplishing that uh, even a single time. We had 0% compliance, and the reason for that compliance was not time. The data suggests that we were on time almost every call. Uh, it wasn't number of apparatus. The data would suggest that we had enough apparatus. We simply did not have enough people. Uh, we were not able to make that 13 firefighters on scene within 11 minutes and 30 seconds. <clears throat> so um, what do we do about this? Uh, from the council's perspective, I would appreciate if you would consider and adopt performance measures when we bring them to you. And we, we plan to continue to watch those, continue to work with our dispatch centers to make sure that we're getting accurate data and tweaking um, our operation to make sure that we're giving the best service to our community. Recommendation three is done. Uh, this was you should continue the three firefighters that were hired by the grant and paid for for two years by a federal grant opportunity. Those, uh, that grant expired 12:30 of 18. Those three firefighters were completed or can, um, included in full in the 2019 budget, so they're currently working. Um, let me back up for two seconds. I did want to tell you just real quickly about grant funding since we're talking about that. In the last three years, we've received over $586,000, $586,000 in grant funding. We currently have another $581,000 in applications that are out and waiting to be answered. Recommendation number four was add company staffing. Before you think it, I'm not here to ask for more firefighters tonight. However, the recommendation was that um, in the midterm, not short term or long term, but midterm, you should add one more person each day, and that would give you three people on the engine and three people on either the ladder truck or squad. They cross staff that truck. And um, you know, we talked about the effective response force. The reason we're not meeting that matrix is because we don't have enough people showing up on the first alarm. So that's one of the things that that would help. Recommendation number five was to continue to provide advanced life support services via advanced EMTs and paramedics. 
on our medical calls. You know, 67% of the time we're making uh, calls that are medical in nature rather than fire in nature. So this is a lot of what we do. And um, to be an AEMT, an advanced EMT, or a paramedic, it's not only a lot of education, a lot of board certifications, and a lot of time spent getting those things, but it's also a tremendous amount of responsibility. And it's a giant leap to come from a, a BLS and EMT certification into an advanced certification. So we're looking at ways to meet that recommendation by CityGate in order to continue to provide that funding, have a uh, plan to continue as our advanced EMTs and paramedics retire out. Um, and move on. Recommendation number six is a three station model. I am also not here to ask for more fire stations tonight, but the recommendation was that in the long term, which CityGate defined as 40 or 50 years from now, we should have three fire stations in, in uh, Fire District 1. So one at the north end of town, one at the south end of town, and one east in the district. So, I apologize for the size of the writing on this one. There was a lot to talk about. Um, we are con uh, currently working with GLMV, an architect firm from Wichita, to look at plans to possibly expand current station one. Um, we are also working to give you some sort of a plan on what it looks like to add station two in the midterm and move station one to the north end of town in the long term. So we would appreciate if you would engage in the planning process. Uh, we all need to keep those short, middle, and long range implications in mind when we're doing this. And we plan to continue working uh, currently with the architects to prepare a plan for you that we can look at for the 2020 budget uh, to possibly do an expansion at station one. Recommendation number seven was to continue to cost share with Butler County EMS. Uh, we do a lot of work with Butler County EMS as 67 or 68% of our calls are medical in nature. Um, we want to get creative and some of the things that CityGate was talking about when they made this recommendation would be maybe even sharing personnel. So the model that they talked about in their report was something such as Butler County provides an ambulance and a paramedic and we provide an EMT to run the truck. So we would gain another truck and then both of those employees would be trained firefighters. So we could cost share the, the cost of the uh, having the ambulance in service for our community and then it could operate for both systems. I do want to say that the current administration ha is changing. Director Poor has uh, left Butler County and has taken another job and Frank Williams, who you may know, uh, has been in Butler County for decades. He's coming back to Butler County and he's going to be the new director. So Director Poor and I have worked together on a lot of this stuff, kind of coming up with some ideas. All of it is on hold until Director Williams gets here and uh, he and I get together and we find out what ideas he has. Uh, he's a pretty smart guy, so I think he and I are gonna come up with some good stuff to bring to you to think about. So recommendation number eight, the only thing I'll say, this was adding battalion chiefs. This was a long range plan and I don't really think we need to talk about it any further tonight unless you have questions about it. Recommendation number nine was to continue the volunteer program. The volunteers on your fire department spend hundreds and hundreds of hours every year responding to calls, operating equipment, maintaining equipment, going to festivals in your name, et cetera. And we certainly wanna continue that. Federal government's helping us a little bit right now with an over $300,000 SAFER grant that we're currently in the middle of. It was a four year project, over $300,000 in funding to recruit and retain volunteers. So uh, in order to do that, we've been working with media agencies, uh, working on uh, how we can get out in the community and get the word out. You know, as well as I do, it's tougher and tougher to get volunteers. You see it at church, you see it at school, you see it right here on your board as you try to fill those other positions in the, in the community. And it's uh, hard for us to find volunteers who want to put in the hundreds and hundreds of hours every year that it takes to stay on top of the game and uh, for no pay and you have a chance of dying when you come to work. So it's a tough gig to get people to, to sign up for, but we're continuing to work to make that uh, a, a sustainable program, and we're committed to that. 
Recommendation number 10 has been talked about a lot. Uh, this was turnout time, and turnout time is a measure of time from the time the fire department gets the alarm until the wheels of the fire truck are rolling out the firehouse. And um, the recommendation from CityGate was that we achieve and maintain turnout time under two minutes, 90% of the time. We're not there. When they were here, it was approximately 75%. And uh, it's 84% in 2018. Uh, it is getting better, and the time is getting closer and closer to two minutes, but we haven't figured out exactly how to get under two minutes 90% 90, 90 of the time. I will tell you that the folks behind me here and the folks that are back at the fire station are committed to, to doing this, and we're working really, really hard to get it done. So recommendation number 11, uh, this is kind of a mulligan. Um, it said that you should, uh, we should review the changes and uh, when funding is available, make them. So this is ongoing, or we could call it done if you want to. Put another checkbox. Recommendation number 12 was move dispatch to the county dispatch center. Um, our response to this, uh, all of these recommendations were uh, the mayor commissioned a group to get together uh, with several council members and the mayor and multiple staff from multiple agencies and we talked about what we were going to do with all of these findings and recommendations and as we talked through the issue one of the decisions that was made was that Andover Fire Dispatch would stay at Andover 911. Uh, that leaves us with some challenges still remaining in that we work with multiple dispatch centers throughout the day but having our dispatch be here in Andover we still have local control and we can make changes when we need to make them. Recommendation 13, 14, and 15, these are all three check boxes. You'll remember that you hired a training captain uh, in uh, a year ago, and uh, these were all about training. Formalize an annual training plan, utilize accurate record keeping, and utilize specific training hours so you have more accurate data. Uh, not only are we doing more training, we're doing better training, and it's all being kept track of just like CityGate recommended. And uh, big kudos to Captain Matson for getting that done. Recommendation number 16 may not be well known, but it's been discussed quite a lot as well. And this is one that I wanna spend just a little bit more time on than the others. So this is called the Alpha Bravo Project. When you call 911 and you need an ambulance, uh, our dispatchers answer the call and we get some of the information and then your call, the fire department is started to your house and then your call is routed to El Dorado where the Butler County uh, dispatchers take over. They ask you a series of questions that are in a protocol form and then they grade the call on acuity, alpha being the lowest or uh, there's less wrong with the patient, it's a less time sensitive matter and echo being you're not breathing and you don't have a pulse. So CityGate's recommendation was you're running a lot of Alpha and Bravo, really low acuity calls at your nursing homes in town. These are facilities that already have people there to take care of the patient while they're waiting or while you are responding to a perceived medical emergency. And I'll be honest, a lot of these Alpha Bravo calls were simply transfers. This patient has uh, had an infection and the doctor has ordered them to go to the hospital by ambulance. Uh, so we need the ambulance to come take them to the hospital, those types of calls. So through the mayor's group and uh, your leadership, we took the CityGate recommendation and said, let's do a pilot program and see uh, if this really holds water. Does, is there value in this? And there certainly was value. Uh, April 1st of 2018, we started the project. The results are overwhelmingly positive. As a matter of fact, let's start with the negatives. We haven't found a single piece of evidence to show any th negative outcomes from this project. So no one was harmed during the making of this and we can't find any negative outcomes. So what were the positives? Well, we were able to find some efficiencies. In 10 months, we were able to not respond the fire department to 328 calls. They, I think the average was, if we just did the math, it'd be 32.8 calls, but I think that holds true. It's around 30, 35 calls per month was the average that we were able to not respond to. So the graphs on the bottom uh, are important to me because I wanna show you on the bottom right, without the Alpha Bravo project, we would have made 1,800 and change calls this year. With the Alpha Bravo project, we made 1,500 calls. I already told you that. 
if I use Excel to help me and we do some stats, we forecast out what will happen in the future. In four years without the Alpha Bravo project, we'll be running 2,200 calls. With the Alpha Bravo project, we'll be running just under 1,800 calls, which is what we would have been doing today. So there's a huge amount of efficiency and we found no negative outcomes. So I would like to make this a permanent change and we continue running Alpha Bravo calls in the manner that we're doing them today. So recommendation number 17, I'm again not he coming here to ask for staff this evening, but the recommendation was to um, add fire prevention staff. Uh, we do believe that that will be important uh, in the future. Uh, we have one fire marshal. He handles all of the fire prevention. That doesn't mean he does everything. He organizes a lot for the companies to do while they're on duty, and they're doing your business inspections and things like that. Uh, we're trying to be super creative with this. I will tell you I'm super excited because we had a gentleman reach out to us. He's a professional in the community. He will remain unnamed, but a professional in the community who wants to volunteer for your fire department. He does not want to be a firefighter. He wants to help with something else. And when I talked to him about fire prevention, he got really excited about it. He wants to help with education and he wants to help with business inspections. All of that stuff is not only going to provide a really good service for our community, but it's going to take pressure off the operations staff so they can continue doing those other things that they really need to be doing. And the last recommendation is number 18, and that was to review those low acuity responses that we talked about earlier, but do it for the entire fire district. There's not a lot, well, there's no support for this locally. Um, I believe that uh, it's really important that your firefighters are heard when they say, we really want to make sure that when our neighbors call for help, we're the ones that are there helping them. And they're super passionate about that. And that's really their number one reason for not supporting this. Um, and I can get behind that. I will tell you as your fire chief, the other side of this, as call volumes continue to increase and workload continues to increase, we will need to revisit this in the future. But we're not there right now. Uh, we have the staffing available to be able to make these Alpha Bravo calls uh, in the district, and I think we should continue to do so. Chief, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. It's back on your previous slide, but you were referring to um, your company's doing business inspections, and you have one base, you know, and Rosie's basically your fire prevention officer. Yes, sir. <clears throat> when you do these risk assessments at businesses and places in town, do you keep a database of potential hazards and stuff that these guys can access on the way? We do. You do? Yes. Okay. So our... It's not great, and we may look at a different program in the future, in full disclosure, but the program we have that keeps our records, our records management system, has what we call in the fire department a pre-plan uh, side of things. Right. So we go out, so the first step is we went out with another acronym and uh, looked at all of the commercial businesses in our entire fire district, and we graded them based on national standards for high, medium, and low risk. And those are risks to the community if there were a fire in those risks. Then we took all of those high risks and we have just completed within the last week or so uh, brand new pre-plans for every high risk in the entire fire district. So that when the captain's on the way to a fire... You know what they're walking we, into, right? Yep. We have pictures of stuff inside the building where uh, any hazardous materials are stored. If we walk in and we see that you have a business where there's a HVAC unit above the ceiling joists, that's important to us because when it's held up there by an unburned ceiling joist, we look at it in the way that, well, what's going to happen if that ceiling joist gets fire on it? That HVAC unit's going to drop on our heads. So we have a completely different way of looking at things when we're doing those types of inspections. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's all I have for the recommendations. What questions, what other questions do you have? I've got just a couple comments. Uh, uh, you have mentioned the Alpha Bravo and your test uh, so far has been very positive. Is that, that right? Yes, sir. You're more or less wanting to make that permanent that we'll be happy to take a look at. My hat's off to you on that. Uh, the other thing that you've done well is the training. We've added the captain uh, to that, and uh, you've done well. And hats off, you've done a lot of these items. It appears the things that are the toughest for us 
our staffing and number of stations. And those are the ones that slowly but surely you'll be addressing to us for some type of, of recommendation down the line. Sometime between now and the next 50 years. Yes, sir. <laughs> I agree with your assessment and those two are so expensive. Uh, you know, we have an entire city to run, not just a fire department. So uh, it's important to to gauge when we need to pull the trigger on those things. And we're in an interesting time to be an Andover firefighter because these things are are happening and these needs are occurring. But um, I do want to say that you kind of teed me up there, but not teed me off, but teed me up. Um, without the support of the community and the council, we wouldn't be nearly where we were. And CityGate gave you a glowing uh, assessment of your fire department and said that these men and women are doing an absolutely fantastic job. I've just proven with data that we're doing even better, but it wouldn't happen without your support So and the community support. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for that. Very Any good. other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, first of all, the report is excellent. Thank you for that. And thank you for the efforts that you all continually make to get better all the time. My question isn't really with this study, but it okay. relates to fire. I was contacted by a community member, and she was, was very concerned, and I listened very patiently, but said this is really a school issue, and the fire department had provided some information, but it has to do with the, with the, the building of the, the new high school and that they keep coming into some kind of underground gas lines that are unplotted and have evacuated the building several times for gas leaks or something? Do, is there some piece of equipment that can help people know ahead of time that these gas lines are down there? She was, she was really concerned about that. And I think she, some fireman had told her there was equipment that could locate these. Uh, you're looking at me blankly. Do no, you, I'm you, sorry for that. You do. I mean, I, I'm assuming that the fire department was notified when yes. schools, okay. Yeah, could, I'm trying could, to, well, the reason I'm looking at you blankly is I'm trying to think, I think, so let me give you an answer off the top of my head. And but maybe I can you could even explain to this exactly what's going on. Sure. And, yeah. I think we've made two. So uh, since the pro beginning of the project, we've made two gas leaks. One of them was a leak and one of them was not. So I know the folks all, that uh, don't have a, a, he's not able to have a microphone back there. So what he said was, we've made two alarms. Both of them were leaks. One of them was a kind of, big, of a big deal to me because we always go to worst case scenario. That's why you have me is to go to worst case scenario. So let me back up and say, how can we detect those lines? How can the construction folks detect those lines? They get them marked. There's a window that they're supposed to operate in without powered equipment. So they're supposed to use hand shovels within that window. We oftentimes get there and either the construction company has not done that, which is rare, or more likely they're operating outside that window. So where they're allowed to have their powered equipment and the pipeline is outside the window. So that happens quite often. And pipelines move in the ground more than you would think. So they give you this window, but the pipeline can move. They can also be marked incorrectly. And the other thing I would talk about tracing the wire or the line, uh, modern installation of those have tracer wires and we're able to actually look at where the wire is. And we're going by that, we're not, but the, uh, the utility marking folks are going by that a lot of times. And some lines do not have that. So we would have to go with this guess. This is where the map says it's supposed to be, so this is where we're gonna mark it. Now, as far as uh, an inordinate amount of alarms at the high school, I appreciate her concern. We're just as concerned to have a gas leak around kids, but the two alarms that we've made have, at the end of the day, been simple gas leaks that were taken care of quickly by the construction company and the gas company and uh, did not require any further response other than just your firefighters coming down and making sure that we knew exactly what was going on and making the area safe. The police department already had that done with, with the evacuations already in place. Okay, so 
again, the questions that I was asked. Sure. This does not present any kind of possibility of explosions or anything like that. It does, but you have to get the gas to a certain concentration to be able to do that. And I will tell you that in a building that is occupied, that gas has an odor in it for a reason. It's really stinky like sulfur for a reason. And that is to let you know that there's a gas leak. So when you smell it, it is parts per billion, the, the, the gas that's present, and it's not enough to even catch on fire. Okay. So by the time that we get the call and come down there, there generally has not been enough of a concentration to have that happen. But on the other hand, the reason you have me is to go to worst case scenario. We treat it as that type of incident every time we go there. Every time we go to any gas leak, we think, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Let's handle it that way. And the school has been fantastic, and the SROs have been fantastic about making sure that everybody's out of the building. So if we had something catastrophic like that, the injuries would be extremely minimal. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, you're welcome. I will try to share that, but I, again, did tell this person to talk to this district, school district as well, but that I was sure the fire department would be working cooperatively with. Yeah, Thank we you. would appreciate it if the lines did never get hit. But right. So, so in other words, there's no, nothing like a metal detector kind of piece of equipment that can go over a piece of ground and let you know there are buried pipes. That's kind of what they use. You'll see them out in their little white pickups, and they have the little yellow wand. That's kind of how they're doing that, but it's really looking for a tracer wire. And, and sometimes they, they have to go, uh, the second incident, I think, was a pipeline. Um, so they have to go on maps on those. But if they've been unplotted, then they're not on a map, correct? <laughs> well, they're, I, I don't think they were unplotted. He said they were plotted incorrectly. Oh, okay. So if you're going by the map and it's incorrect, you stay outside the boundaries, okay. you're going to hit it. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Other questions? Fair enough. I'll just say um, I agree with CR here. Our, our two biggest <clears throat> struggles uh, when it comes to the fire department are going to be another station and or and or a remodel of your current station and staffing. Um, those are two single biggest expenses, staffing probably being first, actually. But uh, I think you've done a fair job um, trying to bring, bring us up to response standards nationally. I know we have some room to go. Um, but I hope, uh, I hope we can get there. Um, can you tell me where the architect is um, with the potential remodel? We, could, we have some big discussions in front of us, Council, I will tell you. Um, what we thought was maybe an $800,000 remodel is ballooned into $2 million. Um, but for 2 to $3 million, you can build a whole new station and leave that one as it is. So um, where are they at? So they've done some more conceptual drawings for you. And um, I'm meeting with Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman Nelson, Councilman Schneider, as well as Mr. Detter and the architect on Friday to go over those further drawings. We had uh, gone back to him, you'll remember, to look at what if we expanded in some different directions. Went north. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our advice to you is, not gonna, is, gonna, is going to be to not do that. The price of that was twice what a new station would be. Right. So yeah. um, in addition to that, he's got a conceptual drawing of you for what that station two would look like. Because I told him we can't continue k taking to the council, well, it'll be between three and six million dollars. That's ridiculous. How can you even make a decision based on that? So he's got some actual numbers for you. Uh, a preview of the number is if you build a five bay station anywhere here with, um, so the plan would be to move administration from station one into station two to take the pressure off station one so that expands the size of that station two just a little bit and it's three and a half million so that's not including the, any remodel of station one right and if we were to do that i would say don't if you did that so i would be asking you for one more person per day you have three shifts so i would need three more people that would take your daily staffing from five to six. We believe we can operate both stations with six people. So you'd have three at station one, your current station that I've been telling you and you've been listening, we're busting at the seams. If you take it back to three people and no admin, then you don't need to remodel it. We continue to fix the things as they 
need it. We continue to stay on top of things like the roof. The roof needs replaced now. But we continue to stay on top of those things, but you don't put a, a, a dump a bunch of money into it. Fair enough. Anybody else have any questions? I have one here for yes, you. Yes, sir. Um, do you have a plotted uh, timeline of all these items that you would like to see done on this recommendation? Uh, some of them may be 20, 30 years out, but uh, it'd be nice to see something on a uh, on a plotted you know diagram to show. Sure. Um, I, I don't. I have it in my head, but I don't think you can see in there. Okay. So let me work on that. Okay. I know you've established timelines. Some of these um, some of these items can be addressed immediately, and we mm -hmm. tackled those first. And you you've done a, a good job at getting those. Some of those are way out there, mm -hmm. um, but I think I think we're now kind of easing into the intermediate stuff where. It's going to take some council involvement to, to make the tough decisions and try and find the financing yeah. for it. So, anything else? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item number eight, which is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve that? Mr. Mayor, I move, I move to approve the consent agenda items 8.1 through 8. Point 14 as presented. Second. Motion by Greg, second by Brian to approve the consent agenda as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine. Uh, I'm going to call zoning case as Z 2018 06. Um, I don't have my zoning checklist, but that's okay. Am I required to have a public hearing at this meeting? No, you're not required to have a public okay. hearing. Okay. So, um, can you tell me when the Planning Commission meeting minutes were recorded? The Planning Commission heard this case at their last meeting in January. Uh, they, they did recommend approval unanimously. The applicant is here tonight. Okay, so I, got, I need to ask the council members a couple questions here. Um, have you all received your meeting minutes of this uh, case concerning the heritage? We have, yes. Okay. Um, have, do any of you have a conflict or bias, a conflict of interest or a bias on the issue? No. no. Okay. And I'm not required to hold a public hearing. Okay. Perfect. And so your background report was pretty simple right pretty simple it's a about a hundred acre site in total this residential portion of the project is a little less than half bounded on the north by Douglas Avenue and on the east by Yorktown right. on the west by the Wellbrick neighborhood JT am I forgetting anything Yes. Have you received any petitions? No, the Office of the City Clerk has not received any petitions. Okay. Fair enough. I think, unless anybody has any questions, we'll bring it up to the bench. For a motion. Mr. Mayor. Yes. There's sound, Mr. Mayor. I would recommend um, or I'd make a motion to adopt the findings and factors and recommendations of the Andover Planning Commission to adopt an ordinance approving zoning case Z-2018-06 to create a planned unit development district and establish a prelim preliminary planned unit development plan of the heritage. Second. Motion by Troy, second by Mike to uh, approve uh, the zoning case 2018-06 as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10, Lafayette Herman. Steve Anderson, city engineer. This uh, project pertains to the neighborhood we call Lafayette Herman. It's on North Andover Road on the east side. If you look at the map there, the uh, north is up. Turnpike's on the south and the Red Bed Trail is on the north. There are two separate projects. There's a paving project 
which includes some incidental drainage. That project will be split 50-50 between the city at large and the benefit district. There's a water line replacement as well, which will be paid for by the city at large. Um, ASM, our consulting engineer for this project, was authorized to begin a little bit less than a year ago and the plans are ready to go. We do have Larry McLean here from ASM if you have any technical questions. We've completed, or close to have completed, the utility relocation work and we've acquired the easement so we would like to proceed with the bidding process. Any questions? Will this have curb and guttering? Yes, sir. It's a real city road. A real city road. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Caroline. I move to accept the plans and authorize the bidding of the Lafayette Herman Neighborhood Paving and Waterline Project. Second. Motion by Caroline, second by Brian to uh, accept the plans and authorize the bidding of those projects. Further discussion? In favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Yep. Item number 11, the Yorktown Parkway Project. Phase two. Anyone handle on this? Mr. Mayor, as you recall, we've had uh, multiple discussions about this section of the road and uh, its makeup. We're asking for permission tonight to uh, approve the design standards uh, for this project. I don't know if the Public Works Director has anything to add to that, but uh, that's essentially it. You're talking about the section between Douglas and Central, right? Okay, also, you know, we had this discussion uh, at our last workshop meeting. Um, I think we were down to the argument two lane versus four lane. I think everybody up here and everybody out there knows um, my feelings on the subject. I just still believe it needs to be four lane. I think you would be doing a disservice to yourself uh, if we didn't approve it as such. Two lanes just not going to handle future traffic demands. Mr. Mayor, I would move to approve the divided four lane boulevard conceptual design of the Yorktown Parkway project phase two from Douglas to Central Avenue, authorize the staff to proceed to final plans for construction. Second. Motion by CR, second by Greg to approve the four lane project um, phase two from Douglas Avenue Central as presented. Further discussion? Yes. Go right um, ahead, Mike. Just want to let you all know that. I have spoken to not just one or two people, but well over 100 people in our city that do not want us to, to authorize a four-lane parkway or highway going through our park. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, we show a green space in, in between with trees that look like they're probably 50 feet apart or more, maybe 100 feet apart. Uh, which is still not even enough. I mean, it's it needs to be a if if you if you did approve this, uh, it needs to be a very heavily landscaped, the wooded area. But everyone that I have spoken to uh, do not agree with the four lane. Um, they halfway believe in a two lane, but thinks uh, we should uh, do another option, uh, which we've talked about many other options in this, um, but. Um, um, I do not agree with the four lane myself. Other discussion? Mr. Mayor, I just, I just have a couple comments. <clears throat> and I certainly appreciate Mike's perspective, and I know that you've uh, consistently had that position, and, and there is merit to that position. Uh, <clears throat> My response to that would be that with, with regard to the park issue, uh, I sure felt that, that Les Mangus had a great response that uh, when you actually compare the four lane to the two lane and the, the amount of additional space that's being taken, it's really pretty minimal. And I'm hoping that the landscaping will be uh, consistent to what 
essentially Mike is talking about, fairly heavily landscaped and proper in that respect. I have another analogy that may be pretty poor, but uh, I, I talk about Andover Road, and I am uh, unhappy of its design that it wasn't five or six lanes to begin with, no left hand turn. So you're stuck behind uh, three traffic lights on, a, on one left turn bay. Uh, we, we have the five lanes when you turn left at Central, but other than that, it's, it's, it's blind luck what's gonna happen. We, we did not anticipate either the growth uh, and the usage of that road. Similarly, I think that the, the four lane, I think everybody, once it's done and will utilize it safely, I think they will be extremely happy that we've done this. And again, if we were to redo Andover Road, I don't know how many millions of dollars that would take, Lunch. taking land from everybody. It's just impossible to do. If you don't do it right the first time, you are sunk. And I, I appreciate uh, uh, when you're out in the uh, rural area, it's it's nice that it stays rustic and, and not improved and so forth. We all would love that, but we we just don't have that today. And I think our wisdom is much better to proceed uh, on the four lane, but I sincerely appreciate uh, your, your comments in that regard. I just wish that uh, um, when this is landscaped that uh, it will be looked at very heavily and um, to keep in mind that you, we don't want to see four lanes of traffic. Um, I think you just want to see two lanes of traffic. I, I was going to say, I, I completely understand, Mike. You know that I was <laughs> batting on your side there to begin with, and I've finally been convinced that this is the best way for us to go. But again, it will also motivate us to get some of that additional park land soon. And I'm confident that we'll handle the landscaping that that will make this an attractive <coughs> boulevard. And I also feel like although it's losing that section of the park, in reality, I don't think that section of the park is heavily used by pedestrian or any it's it's just looked at which is nice don't get me wrong I like looking at open spaces too but I, I think we can do this in a way that a few years from now no one will be looking at it and thinking oh my goodness what did they do to the park I think it'll relieve so much of the problem that Clark shared about Andover Road that this will also help Andover Road so that's the way I'm looking at it well, we can't do anything about end of a road. No, but that, I mean it'll l relieve the traffic so much. That's what I meant. I don't really think you want to move the traffic off of Andover Road to the park, though. Well, I don't think you're going to be moving it up, but some of Just it is. Um, you, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the idea, it, though, that we have another. It'll alleviate some traffic on, on end of a road, and it's not a highway. I don't know who keeps using that phrase. You just did, Mike, as p other people in the community are using it. It's not a highway. Well, it's, it's a it's, boulevard. It's, the, the only difference between a highway and, and the parkway is speed. Right. That's, that's the only difference. So if you went uh, 45 miles an hour on this road, it's a highway. I don't know any highways but, that have I 45 miles an hour. But aren't we tomorrow. projecting this to be, what, 30? Isn't that? The, the design speed's 30. Well, hopefully the design speed's higher than that, but um, what we're, we want it... <laughs> Okay. All right. I won't go into that. Um, <laughs> you, we obviously have disagreed on this for a long time, and that's fine. But this is the moment of the truth, so we we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I, I just feel like we're just we're we're being forced to push to put this in. You're duly noted. Further discussion. Sure. Yeah. So, I've also spoken with, I guess not a hundred people. That's pretty impressive. It's Thank a lot of people. For those that I have spoken with, uh, obviously most of them are against it, but they're not against a four-lane versus a two-lane at all. All of them don't want it at all. 
and I don't really think that's a, an option to not have it at all, considering the, the, the growth that's happened, not just because of the amphitheater, but what's happening right now with the schools, uh, Yorktown. Your central school campus is driving a lot of this traffic. Sure. So I agree with that. Um, my, my initial thought, um, probably to appease all those that were against it and that have talked to me over the last couple of months, has been um, perhaps putting in a two versus a four now, building it that way with the understanding that when we need it in the future, um, we could expand it to four. But after looking at the drawings, uh, the concept drawings, and actually going online and looking at other places that have four lanes that are split in this way and parks, it looks fine. So if I'm going to put looks a road, pretty. it does look. Pretty. I mean, I mean that's that's why they draw it to. Sure. So you know you would be impressed with it. I know, but that's why they draw Kellogg with pretty trees when they're going to do mm -hmm. the fly under and that kind of thing too. It's part of what we have to make our decision from. You have different experience than I do because you've worked with this type of project, not in a park, but in cities. Um, so that being said, with my initial thought was to go with two instead of four, but um, thinking about the future and um, cost and that we're, uh, it just doesn't make sense to make it a two lane to begin with and then move to a four lane in the future. So if I'm gonna vote yes, I, I would vote yes for the whole thing and not try to appease a few people that I've spoken with that didn't want, the, want it at all. I will say too that I feel like we're being forced completely to this. This is not the appropriate road to have a north-south road that's potentially going to be a, a, a don't say an highway. alternative to <laughs> okay so the whole highway thing in in the in the discussion that was had at the school one of the engineers that was up talking black hair i think he has a black beard or something he he said the word highway while he was standing up there nice. when he was representing us that's the reason why people keep saying the word highway but I don't think it's a highway at all. No, what I meant to say was I, I, I wish that we owned the property further east because that's the appropriate place for a north-south. Um, if you look at the, every map, <coughs> it should be another quarter mile north. We're, I'm sorry, east of what. But we can't do anything about we're, it. We're, we're working on it. That's all I can say. Okay. So based on the current build-out um, uh, of what's going on in Andover, I mean, I don't really see another option. So while it's not my favorite option, I mean, I would definitely support it at this point. Perfect. We do have a motion and a second to approve it. <coughs> now that you've warmed and primed up your yes vote, <laughs> I'll ask if there's any further discussion. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Item 12, Building Inspection Department purchase. Got some vehicles, or vehicle, I should say. Our uh, building inspection department has three vehicles with an average age over 10 years. This is a planned replacement. It's been in the CIP. Uh, it's a base model Ford Explorer like the ones we have now. And thank you to Chief Keller for putting it with some of his vehicles for bids. Mr. Mayor, I'd move to approve the purchase of a new 2020, which includes high, eyesight. Ford Explorer for building and inspections, not to exceed $28,854. Second. Motion by CR, second by Brian to approve the uh, vehicle purchase as presented. Further discussion? Just, they have the 2020s out? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's like a year ahead of the year, huh? <laughs> okay, thank Further you. discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, sh motion carries. Thank you. Number 13. The 2020s will be, we won't get them until probably August, yeah. some July, August at the oh, earliest. okay. So they're, they're not available. They're not available right today, okay. but the orders line, will be placed. Be okay, be, Mayor, Council, before you, I have uh, three new vehicles on the uh, uh, request to purchase. Our normal fleet rotation, we try to get rid of vehicles, cycle them out at about seven years of age and about 100,000 miles. The three vehicles we'll be replacing have in excess of 100,000. One of them is about 140,000, and I think they're all about nine, eight to nine years old. Um, the bid on this came this year. The lowest bid was from Rusty Eck at 97,417 for all three vehicles. 
This is significantly more than we've paid in the past, but it was the lowest bid. There was a big jump this year. Um, but total cost for the purchase of the three vehicles, including uh, emergency equipment and labor installation, is uh, not to exceed $118,715.80. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Is this for the exact same model as we purchased before? Yes. They, uh, I think we paid 85, roughly 85,000 last year for three vehicles. Now we're, we are talking about two years difference because last year we bought 18s and this year we're buying 20s, but it still was a significant increase and it was the lowest bid that we had. And we couldn't buy 19s this year since it's a year later? No, it's not an option? It's probably why they were cheaper, because they were the same year instead of the next year. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion. Go right ahead. Make a motion to approve the quote from Rusty Egg Ford uh, for the purchase of the three 2024 SUV police interceptors. I love saying the word interceptor, by the way. At a total purchase price of $97,417 and approve the additional expenditures for associated equipment and installation charges from miscellaneous providers for a total price not to exceed $118,715.80. Second. Motion by Troy, second by Caroline to approve the vehicle purchases as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item 14. Mr. Mayor and Council, I have before you a request for mayoral appointments for the Andover Road Business Improvement Grant Selection Committee, which is a really long name, but um, this is the third year of the program. Um, we've handed or awarded, actions I handed out, we've awarded three grants to date. Um, the nominees before you tonight include Council Member Greg Schneider and Mike Warrington, City Administrator Mark Detter, and then two Chamber Members, Michelle Reuter of Butler Community College and Chris Myers of Myers Automotive. Any questions? What are their qualifications? <laughs> Business owners and members of our community. <laughs> I, I know you, you both did that last year, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. I did not. You did not? Who else was it? I think you were on the committee. We met via email because okay. we did not get, um, we, we are authorized by budget to award three grants and we did not have more than three applicants. So we met via email. I am hearing businesses are calling and asking about it. There's been buzz even in, I guess I'd call the off cycle when we didn't have any money to award. So I, I think there's a good chance we're going to have more than three. We may need to have the meeting, but um, I think we just met via email last year. All right. Hurry. If you Do guys don't mind. Do we need a okay. motion to approve this? If you one? would. Uh, yes, I would move to approve the mayoral appointment of the grant selection committee as presented. Second. Motion by Caroline, second by Brian to approve the appointments as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Yes, we're down to member items. I have a several, but we'll start down there. <laughs> I'm good tonight. I'm fine. Troy. Um, yes, yeah, a couple quick things. We had a WAMPO meeting today. Uh, just a minor change in the, the selection process for projects as they actually added a little bit more money to it. Uh, which means that potentially we could have a couple more um, projects uh, up there than normal for the for all 23 entities. A couple of things that, that came up in my mind that I thought might be important, and I <laughs> wonder if this already exists and we've done it, and I just don't recall. But um, one of the uh, one of the ideas would be uh, over the next 10 years or X number of years, do we have a, a estimate of what the la the city landscape change would be like where the potential uh, new b new builds of homes the new the po and I don't just mean like the corridor that we've or study that we did on Kellogg but for the city altogether would you refine that question you, I, you lost me sure yeah I probably lost myself too so um, is there a projection over X number of years five or ten or twenty of where we think, and we know we're going to go east, potentially a little bit north, to what we think those are going to look like. And the reason 
I think it's important is if we're looking at five to ten years down the road in Wampo, then potentially some of these might be uh, road projects that might be Wampo. Or it's also, I would like to know myself, if Are we talk about new developments and yes, houses, okay. correct? Yeah, like when when the heritage came up a couple of years ago. Now, I, I I guess I didn't have a clue that that was going to happen, and I'm sure that other staff did. And it would have been nice to have an idea of what's going to be happening in my city in the next five years, the next ten years, from what we knew and what we suspect. Will I don't happen. know that we can predict that far in the future but i mean we do have ongoing discussions with developers um we check in with them regularly hey what are you thinking how's this going and and they do come up to our staff and, and share that information it's like yeah we're thinking about this what's the prospects of getting this zoning and uh, getting this plat approved for another couple hundred homes or so you know we we keep we keep a list I don't, um, I don't know if I wanted to get so far into what are what you know the list more um, conceptually as a city. Where do we think we're growing? What do we think is going to happen? And maybe that's asking too much. But I think it would be pretty smart to know or have an idea or um, if we're going to plan on future growth, what that might look like. We have a lot of projects, just like this, the, the deal in um, the park that we approved today. Um, that if we had in our long-term 10-year plan, it said right east of Andover, or right east of uh, Crescent Lakes, for example, it will probably be X in X years. I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but the probability is there that it's going to be. Home. Nobody's going to develop there. That's because there's going to be a highway run through there. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> So anyway, Les, you had a comment, Ted? Well, I, 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 <laughs> oh, it's now you, you I think the answer to Troy's question is pretty simple. I think our comprehensive plan defines that pretty well. You know, it's got a it's got a ten year lifespan as a plan, and there's a future land use map in that plan. And it's I over think that's in the, about the best we can give you, shy of that application. You mentioned the heritage. I've been working with Mike Lease on that project for four years, and he just pulled the trigger a month ago. Until then, it's all speculation. It's it's hard for us to make any commitments, but our comprehensive plan says, yeah, that's a good potential for mixed-use residential and commercial, and, and that's good enough for Wampo's planning. I, I think I answered my question in that document for that. Um, another thought would be we had a lot of uh, stuff at Wampo where or demographics and the expected changes, um, but those were very general. Um, a lot of it had to do with, well, some of it had to do with Wichita, but a lot of it was the country in general, which relates to Andover pretty much zero. And so it might be interesting if we knew what our demographic history was and what we think our trajectory is. I, I know that we're a, we're, a, we're a town of school children, basically. That everybody moves here because of the schools. Most people move here because of the schools. But what does the data say? Does the data say that we have 6,500 kids now, and we had 5,500, and then we had 4,500 five years before that. So we can just forever project that. And in doing so, think about things like parks and equipment or Wi-Fi or you know facilities for the, the larger number of kids that we know we're going to have 10 years from now. We're already talking about stuff like that. I just know, don't know if there's a study that's already been done or if we can do a study or if we can just grab data from WSU because they did a lot of, a lot of that kind of information. The U.S. Census is the best data there is available for demographics. Projections is more of an art than a science. Sure. Ten years ago, no one predicted a downturn in the economy that slowed growth to half a percent from over two in the metro area. Okay. And if I can add to that, if you look at the CAFR that's put out annually, it does have a 10-year history of school enrollment population has within that information there is 10-year history so and i'm sure all that will be taken into account when we update the comprehensive plan too again as i was just in wampa meeting we're talking about all these numbers today and all these projections and um some of it didn't seem relevant to what we were talking about so i just wanted to make sure that as we make our predictions and selections of projects 
local that, that we have all that information. The last thing I, was, I, w I wanted to ask is, uh, I know that we're looking at, um, at annexing a, a plot of land, and, and we've talked before about how you move from dirt roads to curb and gutter, and uh, for them, they have to request it. It has to be something that they request, and I know that we're talking about Lafayette Herman right now and, and how we're gonna now move that. Should we, I mean, policy-wise, do we wanna discuss or think about 100% of the road should be curb and gutter because it's safer, easier to manage, better for the city, or is that too expensive? Or, I mean, it just seems to me like the way to go would be to make everything uniform. But maybe I'm. You have wrong. the power and ability to make that happen if you're willing to pay 100% of the cost. These older neighborhoods with projects like that, we're typically paying 50%. And spreading the other 50% to the benefit district, meaning the people that live on that street, they do have the ability to protest out of that improvement. And so what we've done in the past is, uh, you know, we've had several of our staff members, they're actually walking door to door, talking to these folks uh, and say, you know, how, how about it? You, time to upgrade the street. You ready for paving? And, you know, we run through some... Um, some cost, uh, you know, predictions on what we're looking at. And we've paid engineering firms in the past to, to come up with some, um, you know, potential special assessment costs that these folks would be looking at. <clears throat> I agree. I think every road in Andover needs to be paved. And, you know, um, we've done several projects in the, in the last uh, several years that have improved that. As far as the one we're annexing, um, I don't know what they're going to say. I think they might say yes to water, but no to streets. That's what I'm guessing. Um, if you force the street improvement on them, like I said, they, they do have the ability to protest if they get a majority of those in the benefit district to say we don't want it. Um, and then you have to decide as a, as a city council, do you want to pay 100% of it? And I think, I think that becomes the real question, how much is it worth to you to have every street in the city of Andover paved? I think you need to look at other options too. So some neighborhoods don't fit the whole curb and gutter. Um, you know, there may be some neighborhoods that we look at in the future that uh, we just blacktop it instead of curving and guttering because the drainage isn't necessary. You know, and obviously the drainage is one of the most expensive things that you put in in, in any road you know project. Um, so. When those come up, I think we should just look at, does this meet um, certain criteria? Do we have to do this only because we've done this in the past? Uh, I think we just got to look at what the look of the neighborhood is and how it fits. I agree. And I do, I will say the, the curb and gutter portion of the street is largely driven by stormwater. Um, and there are a lot of regulations concerning that. Leaving open ditches is... Um, I think it's a little more aesthetically pleasing to me sometimes, uh, especially in a more rural na type neighborhood, but it does have a lot of implications concerning stormwater, which the city of Andover would, would be on the hook for. Mr. Mayor, we are bringing back the street policy. I don't think it's going to be at the next workshop because we have quite a bit to talk about the next workshop, but it's been an ongoing discussion. And it's been an ongoing discussion among staff of what we should require for these roads. And uh, the bigger question, obviously, like you said, is how we pay for it. I, I think uh, Council President Nelson has commented several times that this has been an, uh, you know, something that comes up all the time. And it's just not, there's no easy solution to how you divide it up or how you pay for it. Um, and But we are going to bring back a street policy again and try to, talk about it one more time in the fairness of it right you change right, directions right. and agree to pay for it and what are you it's just like this lafayette herman project are you going to go back and reimburse those homeowners for their special assessments same thing on mike main and may streets they're still paying special assessments for their portion of the paving so um there's some equity issues to be concerned about too that's all i had thank you see you I have nothing earth shattering other than I I want to try to respond a little bit to what Troy has inquired about. I, 
again, nothing earth shattering, but I, if I heard you correctly, it was, okay, where's the next development? Where, where are we heading? We're not the developers. That's, that's what private enterprise is for. And if I pick out some place that you don't know about, may, there's probably a good reason why I'm private about that. We have the comprehensive plan where we think things are going to be going, where we want them to go. But we don't know when, when where, what they're doing. Uh, we, we hope to have our city accommodate somebody that's hot to trot, like the, uh, this most recent development. But And it'd be nice if we kind of knew ahead of time, but a lot of times we don't. It's That's why you, you need to be friends with the realtors. You need to communicate along the way, and sometimes they'll ask you, where in the hell do you think you're going? Well, you know, I'd kind of like to get 21st Street underway or Kellogg see if we can kind of get that put together but we don't control that that that's the hard part about this thing sure I wasn't even suggesting that we would control development per se like directly yeah. but certainly having some kind of a sense for um, what will probably happen even if it is a long time in the future or maybe never it would probably be smart when we think about potential street changes or landscaping or parks or electrical whatever we want you know uh, we uh, anyway i get your point totally i just yeah i think it's great to ask those questions because we we got to answer them in the abstract and then yeah I know. all the doers go to less and whoever else <laughs> and try to put it in practice it's hard for you and me to decide because we don't go out and pay to develop the city. Uh, but your, your point's very well taken on those. Thank you. That's that's all I have there. Greg, no comments. Mark? Um, I, I agree with you on, Troy, on what you're talking about. Uh, I, I think we should have, uh, of course, we have a comprehensive plan. It's good for how many more years? 2023. OK, so uh, four more years. And, uh, and it, at some point, we're going to have to start thinking about it, what, two years in advance or something? So in a couple of years, we're going to have to revamp that. So what you're talking about actually plays into the new 10-year comprehensive plan, probably. Yeah. And then at that point, we can start projecting uh, what we think. Uh, so I, I, I completely agree with you that, you know, our city's going to, double in the next 10 years probably I mean it's very possible uh, so we need to you know think about uh, what what other four lane road we're going to put in <laughs> 13th street you know <laughs> park <laughs> yeah it's going to be metal arc <laughs> I'm sure um, but uh, yeah I, I agree with you there I think that's that's coming up pretty soon it's only a couple years away yeah so and uh uh, I, I got more to say tonight, but uh, it's, most of it's probably inappropriate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do we have the beeper? Anybody got the beeper for one? Uh, the audio doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Oh, well, I probably should. I probably should keep going there. Um, but I guess it will be on YouTube later. Um, I would like to say uh, that once again, the city of Andover has. Uh, received a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting they stopped giving you plaques donna um all i have right now is this little um i don't even know what you call that um but anyways i want to extend my thanks to all that you do repairing that uh, preparing that kaffir i know is a pain in the butt but uh once again uh this signifies you've done an excellent job as recognized by uh, everybody so I'll give this to you after the meeting secondly um, I have a question we sold a lot too in the industrial park a couple years ago right hmm. and we sold it at a very nice price has the uh, firm that we sold that to have they uh, even started discussing building anything 
Steve and I are supposed to be having a meeting with the owners in the next couple of weeks. They're also uh, working on Lafayette Herman, but they were getting some. Right. Well, they actually asked for that agreement again uh, because they're working on their, you know, finalizing their loans. So, so that the real estate contract did that have a provision in it? No. We uh, regarding uh, build by dates. No. We didn't, we you did sure not. about that? Yeah, I, I, I looked at it, and I think uh, in this case, we we probably thought working with them as an engineer, we had a little leverage on it, and we certainly have tried to make that point. And, uh, in a Are few you interviews. absolutely sure they yeah, did not I, have I, a provi clawback provision? Yeah, yep. You're sure? You're nodding, you're sure? Okay. Okay. Well, we sold it inexpensively i mean it was, it was it was it was designed the cell was designed to spur them to build quicker and i just haven't seen any activity on it so there's actually been quite a bit of activity going on there behind the scenes they've prepared a site plan and had a partner that backed out on the first site plan so they redesigned the site plan and they've recently made some modifications to their site plan that are aesthetic improvements. And in the meanwhile, they've opened another office in Kansas City, so they have well over twice the staff they had when we entered into this agreement. So awesome. local local guy does good. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, lastly, um, Susan, did you make copies of the email I sent you? No, sir, you did not. You did not. But I can have for you in five why don't you just email it to everybody? Um, I engaged in a discussion with our city attorney uh, regarding um, our pit bull ordinance. Um, several of you have commented that it might be appropriate to have uh, some kind of public referendum on the deal. Some of you are uncomfortable with it. Some of you are fine with it. I, for me personally, I'm fine with the ordinance as it is. Um, but I want you to read this memo prepared by... Um, your city attorney discussing what options should you so choose uh, to to hold some kind of vote. It's not as simple as it sounds. Um, there's a lot of requirements there, um, and I I just wanted you to have that information. Now, trust me, I'm not advocating changing it, but uh, I thought it's my duty as your mayor to inform you of your options. Uh, I know we all catch a lot of flack about it. Um, why don't you email Chief Keller, too? Um, but um, anyways, I just want to let you know your options when it comes to that. Changing the ordinance, not a good option because um, I'd just veto it. But I'm not going to be here forever. I know that. And I, I want you guys to know what you're walking into and what the pitfalls of, of public referendums uh, potentially have for you so if you could uh, email that out that would be fantastic to everybody okay i don't have anything else the staff have anything else chief you're looking looking disturbed now should should we go ahead and talk about what the league has brought up the most recent no i was <laughs> talking about what the mayor was talking about uh, okay should we your latest case no we have um on the uh, projected on the agenda at the next council meeting we're bringing up a, a amendment to the pit bull ordinance right that was discussed in a workshop i was just wondering if you want to see that at the next council meeting or i think we probably ought to entertain a complete discussion about the memo you're going to receive and that prior to voting on that okay that's what i think like on the amended motion. ordinance so You've drafted a minute ordinance, right? Yes. Yes, I've, I've prepared an amended ordinance that would basically be for your consideration as to whether or not with respect to annexations. I'm going to use common parlance here that is not <laughs> legal, but if you wanted to grandfather existing uh, pit bulls upon annexation and simply subject them to the rules that all other exempt uh, pit bulls are subjected to. 
so that 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 would be the purpose of the ordinance would be to to basically grant an exemption for existing animals in areas that are annexed until such time as their lifespan is complete I guess the my, my only question would be is read the memo and um, decide for yourselves if you want to pursue any of those options on there and if you don't then we proceed with uh, reviewing this amended ordinance uh, regarding grandfathering can we talk about this in workshop coming up we can if you'd like um, that will delay that uh... no no it won't we'll, I would just we'll, we'll say I would right. rather have this discussion right here in City Hall if 50 people are going to show up we got more room if we do it in workshop and it shows up on the agenda uh, we're going to get a crowd that's just my my personal right. opinion you know and so we might as well just discuss it in the open and let everybody pile in here like they've done before because it appears to be our hot topic and uh get, yeah get I, I, I don't mean <laughs> i don't mean to bring it up again trust me i for funny but um there was an expression by at least two council members of uh, what are our options let's let the public decide I mean, it's not that simple but uh Read the memo. We can talk about it next Tuesday night, I guess, or our next Tuesday meeting prior to put a discussion item on the agenda prior to um, consideration of this amended ordinance regarding annex, pit bulls and annexation. Fair enough? I don't know. Could, yeah, might, help yeah. might as well. Might as well. Okay. And obviously, you don't want to be discussing this amongst yourselves outside of an open meeting, but uh, be prepared to give your feedback as, as it is. Yes. Yeah, I've, um, if she's going to send you the ordinance and the, uh, the, the draft, I have a memo that I've already prepared that kind of explains the change in the, uh, the oh ordinance God. that. Well, just get it all in there, I guess. I will send it to Susan. <clears throat> okay. That's it. Does anybody have anything else? Staff? Last chance. All right. Let's get out of here. Man. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. It's by Troy. Second by Brian. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned.